Thank you for joining with us this morning on this very special uh, service. We want to welcome you if you're a visitor uh, with us. Uh, in particular, we want to welcome the families and the friends of Peter, Emily, and Precious, the three young people uh, being baptized this morning. Uh, and also just for those members of Crescent Kids, CK will be staying in with us this morning until after the baptisms. I want to read you the last words that the Lord Jesus said to the disciples uh, before he left this earth. We read from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this morning we are obeying that command as three young people go through the waters of baptism. Let's just pray together. Our God and our Heavenly Father, we come before you and we worship you. We praise you that you are a great God, and we thank you for the amazing salvation that you have provided for each one of us uh, through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you for this uh, service this morning, and we pray for your help as we would um, uh, go through these um, uh, baptisms this morning. We just pray for each of, of the young people here. We pray that you'll bless them and strengthen them and, and help them in their walk uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray that for each of us this morning as we listen and as we witness uh, their obedience. We pray that you might speak into each of our lives, or that each of us might be challenged by your word and by the power of a testimony of a life. So we pray this all in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now we're going to sing together. Um, we asked each of those being baptized uh, to choose a hymn that meant something to them. And the hymn that was chosen by Precious was King of Kings, Majesty. Verse one reads, King of Kings, Majesty, God of heaven living in me, gentle savior, closest friend, strong deliverer, beginning and end, all within me falls at their thro your throne. Your majesty, I can but bow, I lay my all before you now. In royal robes I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. Let's stand to sing after the, the introduction.
uh, David Farrell, one of our elders here, is going to speak to us now, uh, and he's going to speak in two parts in our service. First, he'll give a brief explanation of what is going to happen here this morning. David. Thank you, Robert, and can I welcome you all, and it's great to hear that wonderful singing in the Crescent. I'm sure you're wondering what is happening here this morning. If you were to look at our statement of faith as a church, we believe in believers' baptism by immersion. Believers' baptism by immersion. Now, I'm going to, in the second half, as time permits, unpack that with you. But this morning, I just want to, at this moment, tell you what you're going to see. And then afterwards, I'll explain to you the meaning. Shortly, you're here, going to hear testimonies from each of the young people. And key within each of their testimonies is the fact that they have come to a personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That has happened prior to this event. This event is symbolic of something that has already happened and transformed their life. And I would encourage you to listen to each of the testimonies as you hear how personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ has transformed their lives. Then, two elders will enter into the tank, and they will call each person individually, and they will ask them a simple question. And the simple question permits that person to make a public declaration of their faith. It's a public declaration. You see, if something is happening which has transformed my life, something where I have had faith, something which has changed me, how would I show people that? Do I wear a badge? Do I wear a special outfit? Do I behave in a certain way? No, as Rab mentioned, the Lord Jesus Christ left a very simple instruction as to how we would publicly declare that, and that is through the waters of baptism. I'll explain in the second half what that all means in more detail. But each individual will go through that simple, symbolic step. They'll go into the water, they'll come out of the water, and they'll go and get changed. It doesn't change them. It doesn't transform them. It doesn't clean them. Well, maybe the water does. But the reality is that what has happened is it is a public demonstration a public statement of their personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we're going to see now are the baptisms, and then I'll come back to you later on and take five or ten minutes and explain to you in more detail as to what you have actually seen. Thanks, David. Now we're going to stand and sing again uh, two hymns. Um, the first, Yet Not I, was chosen by Emily, uh, and the second, All I Once Held Dear, was chosen by Peter. One of the verses in Yet Not I reads, To this I hold, my sin has been defeated. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Though the chains are released, I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath I long to follow Jesus, for he has said that he will bring me home, and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne. So let's stand and sing uh, these two hymns together.
One of the joys of interviewing people for baptism is hearing them share their story of their journey of faith. And Peter, um, our first uh, candidate for baptism, is going to come up and share some of his story with us now. Peter. I have a bit of a lingering cold, so I need to apologize in advance for that. Um, but for those of you who have not yet had the chance to properly meet, um, I'm Peter. I'm the younger brother of John and James Barker in this church. Um, I was born into a missionary family in Pakistan, um, where I, you know, I was born. I spent most of my life out there. Um, and with my family's background, of course, I was, you know, brought up with Christian values and biblical truth instilled in me from a young age. However, things didn't quite continue as such plain sailing for me. At a young age, I was subject to some experiences that left me bitter, angry, and full of shame. I carried these with me as I left for boarding school when I turned nine. I was finally in a place where I could be with my friends, who were also other missionary kids. I, of course, missed being at home with my parents, but I was glad to finally be around others my own age, and, and it was, a, it was a, great, a great haven, that's for sure. Although a few years in, I started to feel a real weight on my soul. I, it, it was a sort of spiritual and like an emotional suppression in a way. It's hard to explain what it really was like. But it was really the beginning of a few years of what would feel like an endless trial for me. Despite knowing the scriptures well, of course, with my background and having a firm foundation in my beliefs from such a young age, I felt as if my cries to God were being ignored. I knew the Lord was real and I trusted in him, but somehow there was a disconnect. I could no longer feel his presence and hopelessness tormented me for what felt like the longest time. This eventually culminated into a time of deliberate rebellion. I knowingly and with a hardened heart uh, chose to live life my own way. I was tired of striving to live a good life for a God who I believe would never come to my aid. At this point, I'd made some mistakes which I would come to deeply regret. This was the start of the pandemic in 2020, and as we all know, this led to a lot of spare time at home. This gave me the chance to reflect upon my life, my circumstances, the choices I'd made, and my emotional and spiritual state, and what a condition I was in. But that, that is where the Lord and his light shone through, in my darkest moments. My eyes were opened once again to his truth, and all the things I'd been taught and learned about over the years finally began to make some sense again. It felt like a breath of fresh air when in my repentance it finally seemed as if God had broken through the smoke of my life. I finally came to understand that the Christian faith is not about me. It's not about who I am and what I've done. It's about Jesus. It's about who he is and what he's done. As the Lord tells Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. This also applies to us. His grace is sufficient for you and for me. Lay your life, your failures and successes, your fears and ambitions at the throne of our God and wait with a heart of servitude as he transform your life. And he will, just like he did mine. In Christ's laying down of his life, we find ours. His sacrifice, his blood that was spilled, is what has paid the price for our sins. Jesus was put on the cross in the place of Barabbas, who was the true sinner, the true criminal. We were Barabbas. Jesus has taken our punishment and has offered us eternal life with him. The joy we can find in that is immeasurable. In the same way that I presented my life before the Lord and made my choice to follow him throughout my days, you can too if you haven't already. The freedom, peace, and joy you'll find will outweigh anything the world can offer. I've been there looking for it, and I found the truth in Christ our Savior. And if the Lord can transform me with my stubborn nature, 
the Lord can most certainly turn your life around as well. And as I get baptized today and make my public confession of faith, I hope that Crescent Church and all my friends and loved ones here and those who can't be here will hold me accountable to my profession and also by being a great cloud of witnesses will encourage me to run with perseverance the race marked out for me. God is good. Thank you. Now, uh, Jason and Tony will go into the tank, and shortly after, Peter will join them for his baptism. If then, if then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth, but you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ and God. Colossians 3, verse 1 to 3. Peter, do you acknowledge that you have been repented of your sins and have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord of your life? Because of your declaration of faith, and as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Precious is from Enniscorthy, County Wexford, and looking back feels privileged to be brought up in a Christian home, a home where Bible study happened before school and prayer was an essential part of the family's everyday life. She does not have a definite date for when she came to faith, but she knows it was early in her life. From an early age, the gospel was shared lovingly and consistently at church and by her parents and siblings. She has a love for how things work in the world and the history behind it all. She has grown to appreciate God's design and her faith deepened at the wonder of God's creation, both in nature and in the human body. She was challenged by the changing moral dilemmas in Ireland, heightened at times during referendums and subsequent debates at school. The story of how she ended up studying biochemistry at Queen's is one that you, you should ask her personally about. It's a long but a great story. Through it, God has taught her to trust him and depend on him in the midst of initial disappointments. Living in Nervogi Halls, she discovered the diversity of Christians. Precious has been encouraged by people passionate to share God's word and studying the Bible with others has deepened her faith. Queen CU has been such a blessing to her. She has been attending Crescent for a year and is a leader at the Sparrows on a Friday night. Precious shares why she loves Jesus. When she considered the journey the Lord took from heaven to earth and how he faced such hardships for her, looking at the cruelty of the cross and how the Lord suffered there, not for his own sin, in her words, his mercy was for me. She said, I don't understand why he did it for me. It's such a love story. As I look at the whole Bible, 
It's all about Jesus. How he created me, how he died for me, and will one day return to bring me home. He is the only true constant in this ever-changing world. God says in Malachi chapter 3 and verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Precious wants to get baptized before her friends and family here today to profess her faith and love for the Lord Jesus. As a child of God, she wants to be obedient to God by being baptized this morning. Precious. Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Colossians 2, verse 6 to 7. Precious, do you acknowledge that you have repented of your sins and trusted Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord of your life? I do. Because of this declaration of your faith, and as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, we're delighted to baptize you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This charity worked with children in the slums of New Delhi. And whilst there, she witnessed abject poverty and hopelessness as many people there believed they deserved to live in hardship and depravity. Seeing this shocked Emily, and when she returned home, she struggled to rationalize the enormous contrast between those poor young lives and her life and lifestyle. And she hated how God could let this happen. In despair, she prayed and asked God to show her how to love him. She read the Gospel of Matthew and realized for the first time that God loves us so much that he came into creation in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, to suffer and die on our behalf. In response, she prayed that God would forgive her for her sin and come into her life. God showed Emily that his love is greater than the sufferings of this world and that Christ alone can bring hope to all who believe and trust in him. Since then, Emily has sought to live for the Lord. She has found CU at Queen's to have played a big part in her spiritual growth. She has met so many encouraging and inspiring young Christians there. She has also enjoyed the community and accountability she has found by coming along to church here at Crescent. Emily wants to declare before her friends and family today how much Jesus means to her, how he is so gracious and his mercy is wonderful. She wants to be obedient to her Lord by being baptized today as a visual picture of what has already happened in her life through Jesus.
May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Romans chapter 15, verse 13. Emily, do you acknowledge that you have repented of your sins and trusted Jesus Christ as your Saviour and the Lord of your life? I do. Because of this declaration of your faith and as a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are delighted to baptise you in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This evening, as James McKeown from Great Victoria Baptist will conclude our series on Exodus, his message is entitled, A Lesson in Leadership, that's at 7pm tonight. I'm pleased if you can plan to come to our missionary prayer meeting this Thursday evening at 8pm, as Reuben Johnson shares from his time in both Moldova and Ukraine. And please, if you can, come along uh, this Friday evening at 7.30 for an evening of reflection and worship. As four of the local churches in the area get together to worship and praise God as we remember the momentous events that happened at the cross. Then next Saturday, there are plans for an Easter Saturday church day out. Leaflets like... This one should be on your pew somewhere, if you can have a look at that, and uh, um, if you're free, come along to, the, to Whitehead. I haven't been to Whitehead for a while, so that could be interesting. And uh, so uh, let's just look at that, and if, if you're interested, please speak to William Johnson, and also uh, please register um, either in the office or on the online app. Uh, next Sunday, we would welcome you to join us again at 11 a.m. for our Easter Sunday service when we will celebrate the truth of Jesus rising from the dead and the impact that ha that has for each one of us. We serve a risen Saviour. And then definitely one for your diary. Um, I want to invite your friends along to this next Sunday evening when we will have a quick live uh, with Ollie Neal and Jim Crooks here in the church. And that will be a, an opportunity to discuss some of uh, the big questions that are asked in our world today. Um, uh, Jim has, and Ollie have done a series on online, uh, a quick podcast, but this week it's going to be live, so that could be interesting. Um, today, after this service uh, and the refreshments, we will be distributing leaflets about next weekend's services to the community around us. So if you can spare some time, please come along and help us uh, to do that. And finally, if you're free next Friday, um, come along and help out at the Good Friday Cafe in the foyer out from, from 10.30 to 3 p.m. If you're free for a little time, come along and join us. And now uh, David Farrell will share um, the second part uh, of his talk to us. Thank you, David. Thank you, Robert. I don't know if you have ever gone to a restaurant and had a terrible meal. You walked in anticipating and expecting a delicacy. And in reality, whenever you got in, you found the place a bit grubby. The food was oily. It had been cooked in a microwave. I could even do that. And so you came out and you thought, I'm not going back there again. And about three months later, as you're walking through the town, you see this restaurant, and there's a massive sign in the window. And it says, under new management. It's all been painted. You decide to go in. It's luxurious. It's changed. 
you have a lovely meal. What you're seeing this morning is people declaring that they are under you management. No longer living their life as they used to, as Peter talked, for example, about that rebellion, almost shaking his fist at God at times. Others saying that they didn't feel they could were connected with God. God wasn't part of their life. And then they met Jesus Christ and we had what we call testimonies. Okay, we believe in believers' baptism. And when we talk about a believer, you heard the testimonies here. I'm not going to repeat them. Each and every one of them was remarkable, individual, and personal. But each and every one of them came to exactly the same point in their life. They realized that their life was inadequate. They realized there was something terribly missing. They realized that there was a void and a gap that needed to be filled. And each of them with a different journey, whether through a missionary family or from way down south or on the border, it doesn't matter. Each of them came to that exact same spot where they came and had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you listened, Peter was almost bouncing when he told you about the joy and the peace that came into his life. Others refer to the meaning of life and the change that took place because we believe in believers' baptism. So that believer as a person comes to faith in Jesus Christ. But why were they baptized? For two reasons. And the first reason is the most important reason of all. Because the Lord Jesus Christ commanded that we be baptized. He didn't give us an option. He didn't say if you would like to or if it's convenient. He said, be baptized. Go and baptize. And what he was teaching was that when you come to that personal faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, the way in which you demonstrate and you show to the world that a transformation has taken place is through baptism. If you read through the Bible, we have the four Gospels, which tell us about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ from various angles. But then when you come into the fifth book in the New Testament, we have what is called the Acts of the Apostles, and that's the early Christian church. And that's the history of that early church. And as you read through it, you will read about people coming to faith right from the very opening chapter. People coming to faith in Jesus Christ and being baptized. We hear about a man coming from Ethiopia who traveled all the way to Jerusalem, who met another man, who introduced him Jesus Christ. And that man, that Ethiopian man, believed and says, what is to stop me being baptized? And Philip baptized him. We read it later on about Paul in a town. And whenever he's put into prison, and the story of the prisoner and the earthquake, the story is well known. And the prison guard came to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he and his family were all baptized because they came in personal faith. Believers. Baptism. What does the word baptism mean? Now we come from various backgrounds as we sit in this room. And I'm not going to move into the controversy of what way it should be performed. I would rather just tell you what the word means. And you can decide how accurate it is. 
The word is a technical term. There's nothing unusual about it. In the ancient world, they would have used the word baptism quite frequently in daily life. So what did they understand it to mean? If you'd gone along to a man who was dyeing a piece of cloth, and he had washed the garment and he was going to put it into a dye, he would have, to use the language, baptized it. He submerged it into the dye, held it in the dye, and brought it out of the dye. If you'd gone to an ironmonger and he was working with a piece of hot metal and it was red hot and he wanted to cool it down, you ask him, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to baptize it. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to take that piece of iron, I'm going to dip it into this bath of cold water, I'm going to wait till it cools down, and I'm going to lift it out. The very word talks about what you have seen. Baptism. Believers, baptism. By immersion. I want to read to you from Romans, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Bear with me. If you don't have your Bible, don't worry. I just want to pick up a new phrase. But it says this. This is Paul talking about baptism. He says, therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Let me read it again. We were buried with him through baptism into death. And then, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. It's hard to believe that it's Easter. It really is. Easter's around the corner next week. It's as early as it could possibly be. But what is Easter all about? Well, yes, it's a time whenever we as a family get together and have a meal and children enjoy Easter eggs, etc. But it's more than that. It's because it's a time when we remember that Jesus Christ died. That's our Good Friday service. Please come along. We haven't been able to hold it for a number of years because of the COVID restrictions and then the subsequent aftermath. We now can. Please come along. But on that Good Friday, as we call it, Jesus died on a cross. He died for you. He died for me. He died, Paul says, to become a curse for us. In other words, he took upon himself the sin of the world, the punishment which was yours, which was mine, he bore there on the cross. He died. And then that night or that evening, he was removed from the cross. And they took him along to a tomb and they placed him on a shelf in a large stone tomb. And then they rolled a mass of stone across the entrance to the tomb and they placed a Roman guard on the front of the tomb. And for Saturday, he lay there, dead. And then on Sunday morning, he rose again. This is the foundation to the Christian faith. If you can disprove the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, I will walk away from my faith. I challenge you. If you can disprove to me 100%, Categorically, that Jesus did not rise from the dead. Paul says, we're fools. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. And by rising from the dead, he showed that he had conquered death and all its consequences, that he liberated us from the punishment of sin, that we were born again. We have a new life. 
That's what Paul's talking about when he says we come into a newness of life. So what did you see? You saw a tank filled with water. It is warm. You'll be delighted to hear. A tank filled with warm water. The person who went into the tank made that personal confession. I believe. They then were submerged into the water to symbolize death. They were momentarily held under the water symbolically and they were brought up again to symbolically and I stress symbolically bring about and demonstrate and show a newness of life. If you follow what Paul said in Romans chapter 6, basically what you saw here was a funeral service. You saw somebody said, I've died to my old self, but I've risen again in Christ. That's what you saw. And it all hinged on a believer's baptism, coming in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ under new management, a new life. And what they want to do is to tell you and to demonstrate to you and to show you that they have come to that point and a point was made in one of the testimonies that collectively we hold each other responsible as we walk in that newness of life. It's a fantastic service. It brings so much joy to our hearts to see young people coming to faith in Jesus Christ, to follow his command, be baptized, not optional, to go through the waters of baptism to say, I'm under new management, transformed, changed, no longer what I used to be. Please feel free to those who were baptized this morning to talk to them, to engage with them. You know them. Please feel free to talk to us. But this is the reality of the transforming power of the salvation which is ours through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we come into your presence and we Thank you for each and every one who was baptized this morning, for Peter, for Precious, for Emily. We commit them to you as they embark upon this phase of their life. We thank you for bringing them, our Father, to this point. Our Father, we just pray for them and their families here this morning. We also pray for each of us, our Father, that as we witness what we have seen this morning, that we may rededicate our lives to follow and to live for you. And our Father, that each and every one of us, whether we are Christian or not, may be challenged by what we have seen. But our Father, we pray that those who are not Christian, who have not come to that point, that they may realize the joy, the peace that comes through faith in your Son and come to that point of a personal faith. We thank you, our Father, for the time of friendship and fellowship we'll be able to have in the cafe afterwards. We commit our time to you but ask for your blessing upon us now as we part. In the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Thanks, David. We're going to sing a final hymn together. Um, This hymn is called This I Believe. Uh, One of the verses says, Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus, our Savior. I believe in God the Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. So let's uh, stand and sing this together after the introduction.
Thank you everybody for coming. Our, our service is over, but we want to encourage you to stay with us. Um, if you go out this door over here on your left, um, you will come to a junction. If you go left, you come to our cafe, and if you go right, you come to our minor hall. So the friends and family of Peter, Precious, and Emily will go right into the minor hall where you will uh, receive some uh, refreshments, and all the rest of us will go to the cafe on the left, okay? Thank you. Got that? Clear as mud. Thank you very much.